Hi! Today we're going to be telling you about the comedy of manners. Comedy of manners is a style of comedy that deals with behavior, reflecting the life, ideals, and manners of the upper class society. Comedy of manners is considered a high comedy because it involves sophisticated wit and uses minimal physical action, relying mostly on the use of heavy dialogue. The style of comedy flourished in the Restoration period, which ranged from the 1600s to the 1700s, and continued on through the 1800s, even after the end of the Restoration period. By the new playwrights reviving the old. A comedy of manners play usually uses both satire and farce, while being carefully constructed to satirize the audience watching the play, typically the middle and upper classes. Comedy of Manners, Restoration Comedy, is a genre of plays in which portrays the manners and affections of one or more social class. Most of the characters are often portrayed very stereotypically, as this is a very mocking genre. The plot of the comedy, mostly involving a scandal, is normally less important than the witty dialogue, meaning the playwrights are more focused on making the dialogue more witty than making the plot of the play make a lot of sense. The types of plays are mainly scandalous, love stories, and <laughs> rivalry plays. Some plays performed are The Rivals by Richard Sheridan, The School for Scandal by Richard Sheridan, and The Concert Wife by W. Somerset Maugham. When performing a comedy of manners, act actors would often dramatize and satire the upper class. Actors would often speak using witty language, and rapid repartee was normal. Actors would remain prim and proper throughout the play, even if their characters became annoyed or angry. <laughs> The actors would mostly rely on their given dialogue and less on big movements, often using only simple movements. Highly graceful and elegant patterns of movement were encouraged, and all actions would be either precise or inventive. Gestures were very important, and an entire array of facial grimacing, winking, and smiling was developed. The men would strut and use copious flowing hand gestures and posing. Evil actors flirted over and behind fans and half masks and handkerchiefs. An actor's tone was used to convey emotional quality to the audience and precise pronunciation was encouraged. Sets. Sets in comedy of manners could go either way in simplicity or complexity. Dialogue during the sets was the main focus as it was mocking and satiristic, yet still in the language style of the middle to high class in that era. This era covers a large time period, so it depended on the play because certain plays mocked and poked fun at certain classes. This could be the coverage they sat on, the clothes they wore, and the way in which they spoke. Costumes were everyday clothes on stage, which included high dress. Every part of the body was covered in something, be it a sash, handkerchief, earrings, large plume hats, curly hair over the forehead, and down the shoulders. Every part of the body was covered in something, be it a sash, handkerchief, earrings, large plume hats, and curly hair over the forehead <laughs> and down the shoulders. Long waistcoats, stiff cuffs, and ruffles and ribbons marked the sign or wealth of higher class. Women wore gowns and skirts commonly along with their veils. Indoor women could share their faces, hands, and neck. Outside, they were covered with hooded cloaks. As time went by, men showed more of the legs and women showed more skin. Both men and women wore plenty of makeup, false noses, beards, mustaches, and powder. Because of all the makeup, facial expressions were to be avoided because it would crack. Props. Women had handkerchiefs, muffs to carry around to keep their hands warm, and to hide secret notes in them. They also had huge hats. <laughs> Men would wear watches and they'd have handkerchiefs presented and then when they presented items, it would be on salver. Many people carried around diaries so that they would always have them handy. Trays of tea would include things such as teacups, they would also include plates. Is this a saucer? Yeah. They would include saucers, spoons, and so many other things too. Trays of 
of tea would also include we would have plates, napkins, sugar, cream, dish of butter, it would have things such as cakes, and it would also have muffins. of manners was Oscar Wilde. <laughs> His most famous play was The Importance of Being Earnest. This style was first developed into the new comedy by ancient Greek playwright Menander. His style was often copied by other playwrights like Roman playwrights Plautus and Terence because they enjoyed his bold characters and crazy plots. There's also French playwright Molière, and he was best known for his comedies, who poked fun at the pretenses of the ancient regimen. Some of his most famous famous plays being Le Col de Femmes, which is the school of wives for those who don't speak French, and that was in 1662, and then Le Misanthrope, which is the Misanthrope, and it was in 1666. <laughs> and most famous, Tartuffe. His most famous play was Tartuffe, and it doesn't have translation. 1664. The importance of being earnest, written by Oscar Wilde. This play is a trivial comedy, more meant for serious people. It was first performed on February 14th, 1895, at the St. James Theatre in London. Some reviews praised the play for its witty dialogue, which is why this is a very famous play. But other reviews were cautious about the lack of social messages in the play. The play only got 86 performances before it got shut down due to, due to the imprisonment of Oscar Wilde. After his release, he was a free man. But he also published the play from exile in Paris, but wrote no further comic or dramatic work. This play was reviewed many times since its premiere and was adapted for the screen on three separate occasions in 1952, 1992, and 2000, which involved cutting quite a bit of the original material. <laughs> the importance of being earnest. It's the story of Jack Worthing, a carefree young gentleman and the inventor of a fictitious brother, Ernest. Ernest's wicked ways afford Jack an excuse to leave his country home from time to time and journey to London. While in London, he stays with his close friend and confidant, Algernon Algy Moncrief. Jack falls in love with Algernon's cousin, Miss Gwendolyn Fairfax. Jack, under the name Ernest, has won Gwendolyn's love, for she strongly desires to marry someone with the name Ernest. But when he asks for Gwendolyn's hand from the formidable Lady Bracknell, Jack finds he must reveal he is a foundling who is left in a handbag at Victoria Station. This disturbing confession causes Lady Bracknell to insist that Jack produce at least one parent before she consents to the marriage. Returning to the country home where he lives with his ward Cecily Cardew and her governess Miss Prism, Jack finds that Algernon has also arrived under the identity of the non-existent brother Ernest. Algernon falls madly in love with Cecily, but with the arrival of Lady Bracknell and Gwendolyn, Jack and Algernon struggle as their double lives begin to catch up with them. As both men claim to be earnest to please their loves, things quickly begin to unravel and chaos erupts. The problems are resolved in an extremely charming way as Jack and Algernon discover that the importance of being earnest while simply answering to the name Ernest.